Mizmor David, Lehezi Mild. Lord, do not in your rage punish me, or in your anger discipline me, for your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down upon me. Because of your indignation, there is no soundness in my flesh. Because of my sin, there is no peace in my bones. For my foolish deeds are broken over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Because of my foolishness, my stripes stink and putrefy. I am bowed down, completely broken down. All day long I go about dirty. For my loins are full of burning, there is no soundness in my flesh. I grow cold, I am completely crushed. I groan from the groanings of my heart. Lord, all my longings are before you. My sighings are not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength leaves me. Even the light of my eyes goes from me. My loved ones and friends stay aloof from my plague. My relatives stay at a distance. Those that seek my life set traps. Those that seek my harm speak of pits of destruction. All day long they mutter lies. But I am like a deaf man I do not hear. I am like a dumb man that does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth there are no arguments. Because I wait for you, Lord, you will answer, Lord my God. For I said, in case they gloat over me or exult themselves over me when my foot stumbles, for I am all ready to fall, my pain is with me continually, I will confess my evil. I am anxious about my sin. My enemies without cause are dangerous. Those who hate me through falsehoods have become many. Lord, do not forsake me. My God, do not be far from me. Be quick to help me. Lord of my salvation. So, so Sue, I was absolutely, I mean, one of the things that I read about in your, um, your commentary was this completely new to me that the, that the fact that in the in the Qumran Psalter the um, uh, this psalm that we're going to be looking at actually occurs in a different position yeah that's just in one heading. scroll exactly yes it's what we call 4 QPSA in other words the scroll found in cave 4 um, and a lot of the psalms in that cave actually do have different order but actually most of them are at the at, in books four and five so this is really unusual that one psalm our psalm 38 has been picked up and transferred into uh, so as it follows psalm 70 sorry precedes psalm 71 it's got the heading for a memorial offering and seven psalm 70 also got that heading for a memorial yeah. offering and it seems as if it's that psalm 71 had to be preceded by the psalm which was for the memorial offering we might talk about what that means later on but that that was the heading that actually mm. allowed the psalm somehow to be transferred to a different place so um mm. if you look at it how it fits it doesn't fit quite as well as you could argue it fits in our canonical Hebrew connection here. But it's only one in that particular scroll, although other scrolls from K4 also have lots of uh, uh, Psalms which are um, put in different places. Well, well, that's very much what I wanted. I mean, that would be very germane to, what, uh, to Malcolm's um, way of, of, of responding to the Psalms. So I'll <laughs> talk to him about that in a moment. But first of all, can I just sort of thank you again for, uh, for joining us uh, for these conversations. I'm sorry it's been actually a little bit of a, uh, a long period since the last one. Um, as you'll know, as, uh, if you've been following them before, they were based on the, we started them um, based on, the, on the, the two books that Malcolm and I wrote during lockdown. Um, this is um, David's Crown, 150 um, poems that Malcolm wrote responding to the 150 Psalms and um, the Book of Praises, a selection of the illustrated translations of the Psalms that I've been doing over the years. And as you'll see, we're 
delighted to be joined again by Professor Susan Gillingham, um, who has just completed what I've discovered is a 22-year <laughs> work on... Um, I, in fact, I just, on my doorstep, uh, appeared um, yesterday, the um, Psalms through the centuries, the um, her sort of study of the reception history of, of the Psalms, which has finally got to Psalm 100... And, to the get right to the end of the Psalms. Um, this is what it's mm, 73 to 151, 151. Which, as before, is wonderfully illustrated and I mean tells you absolutely everything you want to know about the reception history of the Psalms. From so it's a, I mean, it's an amazing feat and triumph of scholarship, and we we really ought to be sort of drinking a, a glass of champagne to to celebrate this. Um, but instead, we are going to be looking at one of the most searing and painful of, of all the psalms. Um, so Malcolm, perhaps I can um, take you into Psalm 38, which, I mean, Sue was just telling us about it being in a different position in, in the in, in, um, Qumran, but actually, I mean, you, because in your, your, um, your poems, you very much, the, the context is incredibly important. And so you go from Psalm 37 to Psalm 8, 38 here, which is a, a really sort of, I, I found that an extraordinary trap. Obviously, I was constantly doing this thing because of the last line of one psalm being the first, one poem being the first of the next. And sometimes the transitions work incredibly well. But when they don't, they still provoke thought. And uh, Psalm 37, as you know, is, you know, it was a wonderful long psalm, but it begins, fret not thyself because of the ungodly, neither be thou envious against elders. In fact, it repeats, fret not thyself several times and um, don't get worked up, you know, don't worry, things will be, you know, things may look bad now, but they're going to be set right soon and they'll be, the wicked will disappear and so on. Mm -hmm. And it always seems to me kind of strange that Psalm 38, following hard on the heels of 37, proceeds completely to ignore all the advice of Psalm 37. And if there was ever a fretful psalm, if there was ever a psalm of somebody getting completely worked up and so upset that they're losing the plot, um, then it's Psalm 38. Now, because of the way I'd written my response to Psalm 37, you know, I'd sort of ended um, 37 with the line, about and I'm not going to fret myself anymore because you know, and I'm not going to worry about the wealth of others. I've found my God and my true friend. So that had to be the line that I started 38 with, and I had to work with that and think about what that meant. But the line in 38, as I read it in Coverdale, that actually kind of cut through to me was in verse eight I am feeble and sore smitten, I have roared for the very disquietness of my heart. And as it happens, I, uh, at the time I was working through this, I was having various physical ailments and aches and pains and having really quite extreme sort of um, gut pains in my innards, where I, whereby I was actually literally crying out and, uh, and uh, you know, not bottling it up. So I thought, golly, I know what this is about, you know, and there's the question of whether or not some of these things were to do with my own choices or my lifestyle or whatever. So, so I was I was wrestling with all this stuff and uh, and the psalm just cut through to me. Um, and uh, that sense of being also, as it were, you're roaring out and yet you're also somehow deaf and dumb and, you know, it was obviously in the middle of lockdown. We were all very fearful about what illnesses we were getting or not getting and whether, and the line about the friends and lovers being standing far off. We were all, you know, there's a bit of social distancing in this psalm as well. So all those things sort of came together. And um, I rather allowed myself to sort of, as the psalmist does, to vent my feelings a bit. Um, and then, uh, but I was very troubled by and and spent some time thinking about that transition. Um, but I think in the end, the transition did something for the poem. I know, Sue, you were going to 
you were wondering about that transition too. Well, no, I think your second line, heaven knows I need his friendship now, mm. says it all really. You know, it's a, yeah. I found my God and my true friend, which is the end of that's 37. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and of course, heaven knows I need his friendship now. <laughs> I found my God and my true friend, it stands in stark contrast with the actual opening, which is yeah. of Psalm 38, which is put me not to rebuke, O oh Lord. And I, but one of the things I've done in the way I've read these Psalms, as you know, I'm trying to do it Christocentrically, I'm doing it as a mode of Christian prayer. I know there are many other modes in which the Psalms can be said, but, and I think that because we know how tender and gen tenderly and gently God has come to us in Christ, then the moments of distrust or the moments of anger or the moments of doubt about God that we have and that we share with the Psalmist are all the more terrible because we should be assured you know we have so much more assurance in some ways than the psalmist had yeah. so th those were the tensions that were going on for me both as i read the psalm and as i wrote the poem and i think one of the things that this um psalm um, we looked at the penitential psalms a little while back with, with mark whiting and this is obviously one of the penitential psalms but in this one there's very much the sense of sort of physical suffering mm. and sort of spiritual suffering mm. both go together and um, and, uh, you know, there's some which kind of make things worse for every, um, but the, I mean, the, the verse that, that I really, um, uh, and I mean, it's interesting to see what you talk about is the different way that the sort of Jewish and Christian um, uh, sort of uh, commentators have responded to that one. Mm -hmm. um, well, you perhaps can tell us more about that, but one sort of more sort of um, generally, I mean, to the nation and one more to the sort of personal mm -hmm. um but the i mean in a sense the, the verse that i really talk about when it, or, or sort of highlighted for me was where it says all my longings are before you my sighings are not hidden from you so it's it's mm -hmm. actually all those things whether they're internal or external whether they're national or um or or, or sort of personal are actually things we can sort of bring to God, as it were. And I, mean, I don't know, Sue, if, if you want to perhaps talk I'd like things. to just say something about your book too and link it to what mm. Malcolm's just been saying, because you present in, in your in your own book, we've both got a copy of it here. Um, mm. You've got the way you present the psalm. It's it shows its fretfulness. It's all the Hebrews interjoined with the, the with the uh, English script mm. and, the, and the, the actual pain of the figure that you, you present there. I mean, visually, you you show us what is there in the text, and I think you know that is actually quite. Um, Yes, yeah, so, I mean, one of the things I really wanted was the sort of typography to be part of yeah. the of the mm. thing. And as you say, that, that's this very, um, I mean, it, it's sort of kind of going from one subject to another, isn't it, very much yeah, in, in the sort of yeah. <laughs> And did you feel when you were doing that that figure, Roger, and were doing, did you feel a certain kind of relief or release in being able to, as it were, get this stuff out, you know? And <laughs> yes, I mean that, that again. That isn't. I mean that's really one of the things about the sort of psalm. I mean it is that this is an incredibly raw and sort of painful thing. <laughs> Actually, I love the in in, in your um, poem the the actual. Um, you know, you have this quite. I mean, you, we've mentioned the one about um, heaven knows I need his friendship, but there's also the the stress and strain of chronic Ill illnesses have laid me low. And there's this quite quite sort of idiomatic uh, uh, English sort of thing which sort of breaks into the which is. I mean, again, I mean, the, the psalm is very like that, isn't it? It's it's quite it's quite raw the whole. Um... If I was to look at it in the context of the next psalms, I mean, there are four psalms we run into now: thirty-eight and running on to thirty-nine, forty, and forty-one to the end of book four of book one, which are all on this theme of illness and, and mm. not always chronic illness, but the the muteness of the psalmist in, in thirty-nine can't speak about it, you know, just just in such pain. So this is just the start of three others about to follow, which deal with this issue of pain. Yeah. And I think the difference between this psalm and the other ones is that it links it to with sin and the suffering is due to sin that creates lots and lots of issues for us um, in this case you could argue the psalmist genuinely did think he'd done something he or she had done something wrong which was creating this 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 uh, this issue but of course it has become a it does become quite a big problem for sufferers if you link that you know the the suffering with the need to confess in order to try and get get it right and of course the new yeah. testament teaching releases us from all that you know jesus is healing Absolutely. the paralytic you know and there's healing but now your sins are forgiven the two aren't 
necessarily um, totally related. Yeah. So I think it's an interesting psalm in the way it deals with sin as well as suffering, and, yeah. but it actually does lead into mm. the other psalms as well. So that, I that think it's very helpful where it's written in, so intimately in the first person. Yes. Like the yes. psalmist, the voice of the person in that, yes. they're entitled to theologize their pain. If there is sin, you know, yes. they can make that link. What yes. we can never do is make it for somebody else. You know, the disciples are wrong when they point and say, who sinned yes. this man? But we can sometimes personally yes. use suffering as a goad to help yes. us turn to. That's the, true. God. I think just to go back to your Christocentric reading, Malcolm, um, one of the issues that I think that, that that has come up between Jews and Christians is that there are many confessions for sin in this psalm, um, you know, verses uh, five and six, uh, sorry, uh, yes, verses um, three and four and five um, about my, I, there's no health in my bones because of my sin. And then you have it again later in verses 17 and 18. Uh, I'm ready to pour my pain. Is over. I confess, confess my iniquity. I'm sorry for my sin. That's really difficult if you're going to put it into the mouth of Christ. And I think mm. what one had to do uh, in, in Christian terms is to talk about Christ, the presence, though not necessarily yeah. um, the one yeah. who's there bearing it for us, but not necessarily yeah. the one who has to confess. Yeah. Yeah. Though, though in a curious way, I think that passage of Paul, he says, he was made to be sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. That there's one reading at least of the, the agony in the garden on the cross, which is to say that although he is without sin, Christ experiences the utter pain and alienation, which is the condition of sin. Yeah. He experiences it even though he's not guilty of it. And that is, of course, what one has to say sometimes to sufferers who don't believe that they deserve it. They are experienced in that general sense, as Christ himself did, of yeah. the pain and suffering of the world. Yeah. It's yeah. not just because of their sin. Yeah, there's no direct the cause and effect, but it's part of our whole condition yeah. into which Christ really enters. Point. And I, I think, think that's why Jews good. found it so difficult, you know, that, here, that, that they, they recognised that uh, here was this supposedly sinless Christ, but the, Jew, but the Christians were actually bringing him into this particular psalm. And mm. for the Jews, as you said, Roger, it actually becomes a means of expressing the pain and suffering of the people, the people in exile. Yeah. You know, yeah. they can confess their sins. They know they've deserved it and so on. So it, it, it's for them a more legitimate, authentic reading of the psalm than us trying to twist it in a Christian context and have <laughs> Christ yeah. with us in a bit of it, but not, a, not an all. But Malcolm's answered that perfectly. He is with us in all of it, but in a different way than we might think. Well, I think yeah. that's a very good point to, to have Malcolm's poem. And to, um, if we, I mean, there's so much more we'd like to talk about. But right, yes, I'd like to hear more about, about the reception. <laughs> history. I love the fact that Sue, Sue's making me realise, Sue's work is making me realise that this little conversation, even that we have now, is part of this huge long conversation about the Psalms that's going on yeah. between religions and over the ages. Anyway, here's the poem. Psalm 38, Domine Nain Furore. For I have found my God and my true friend, and heaven knows I need his friendship now, for I am weak. My days draw to an end, or so it seems to me. I sigh and bow my head in bitterness. The stress and strain of chronic illnesses have laid me low. How can I praise you when I roar with pain, smitten with affliction and infection, no sooner soothed than in distress again, and made more bitter by the sad reflection that half of this I brought down on my head in folly? I deserve my dereliction, my portion of disquietness and dread. Forsake me not, O oh Lord my God, make haste, deliver me and raise me from the dead. 